Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC213, our course on the end times. Thank you for joining. Could somebody pray and we'll start? Lord, um, Father, we thank you for this time, oh Lord Father. We thank you for giving us an, another day, oh Lord Father, in our lives, and also this opportunity, oh Lord Father, to gather here as one body, oh Lord Father, to learn from your word, oh Lord Father. Uh, as we're going to start our classes, Jesus, we ask for your help, uh, Holy Spirit, God, help us to understand, uh, help us uh, uh, to receive uh, and to steward everything that you are teaching us. We submit everything into your precious hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So um, this past weekend I was in Shillong, uh, not for holiday, <laughs> but for uh, ministry. Uh, this was a uh, uh, this was a movement that that was started. Uh, it was, but you know, when the Welsh revival happened in 1904. After some years, some of those missionaries had come to India, and they'd come to this part of our country in Shillong. It's called the Kasi Hills. So the revival broke out here as well in India, uh, in the Kasi Hills. And there was a move of the Holy Spirit. And out of that, uh, of course, a lot of work was done. But one of the churches, uh, ministries that was birthed out of that, uh, in the 1930s, was um, this um, uh, the, the, the name is called Church of Jesus Christ, Assembly Church of Jesus Christ. It's called that's the name of the movement. But so that came out in the 1930s. So they started there almost almost 100, uh, 96 years ago. <laughs> they started. So now it's uh, you know in the third generation of leaders. You know it's transitioned, and so now new set of leadership. And um, so every four years, they have a general conference. They bring all their... So now there are about 120 churches. They have multiple... Not 120 churches, sorry, 120 pastors. And they have multiplied. So their number of churches, maybe 60 churches, something like that. I'm not sure exact number. So they once in four years, they have this conference. So they all get together and uh, they set direction and all of that. So they invited me to be one of the speakers. And so it was the first time for me in Meghalaya. And we have a church in Nagaland. So that's, you know, we go there quite often. But Meghalaya was uh, first time. It was very nice to see what God has been doing. You know, the, 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 they have a rich history, you know, from where they were born, where they were start, um, where the church was born and started. Um, but there's also a great need because they still need, the younger generation now it's you know three or four generations later uh, they still need to understand the word of god and the work of the spirit and you know uh, there's a lot lot to be a lot of work to be done so um, it was nice on saturday night i preached on the holy spirit and then there were, there were like 2000 people inside the tent uh, a lot of people sitting outside and uh, it was on a hillside, you know, like it was all hilly area. Yeah. So that Saturday evening, at least, I don't know, maybe 200 some more people for the first time received the Holy Spirit, started praying in tongues. Uh, but it was, you know, we prayed from a distance. We didn't lay hands and pray because this big crowd. Then Sunday morning, it was the crowd was even bigger because they invited people from all the neighboring villages to come. So it was very interesting. About two thousand people under the tent, two thousand people outside, and people sitting on the hills, hill slopes. Just kind of a, just to see that was a, as I was imagining, you know, how it will be during Jesus' time. <laughs> They'll all be sitting on the hillside, <laughs> and he'll be speaking to them. It was something like that, you know, because very hilly area, and they were actually sitting on the, and they put big speakers outside. They're all listening, listening. But that service was very powerful because more than 200 people gave their lives to Christ and then we invited them forward they came and then we prayed ministered uh, and then straight away led them into Holy Spirit baptism and many of them received so it was 
they got saved, they made a public commitment to Jesus, they came forward, we prayed over them, and then led them into the Holy Spirit baptism. You know, so just be nice. And Sunday evening was more of a call for young people, lots of young people. Yeah, lots of young people. Uh, the message was more of challenging the young people to use their skills for the kingdom. Yeah, just showing them how. So we spoke about the church that Jesus is building. And so more, about more than 70 young people came forward and gave a call so that, yes, God, I want to serve you with what you've given me. And so, so it was nice. And it is, for, for me, also, it was nice just to see, you know, what has happened out of uh, like now 60, no, no, 96 years, a ministry that has lasted three generations, you know, like how it is now. Three generations later, how uh, it was very, very encouraging uh, to see uh, how they are journeying and all of that. Yeah, so that's what happened last weekend. <laughs> all right, so uh, let's uh, quickly review uh, what we have done so far. Is uh, we have tried to give an overview. Of the sequence of events, right? So, and I'll just you know use this chart here uh, that's on page fifty-three, uh, the chart that just to kind of re repeat repeat this thing uh, overall. Then we will move forward. So, what we've uh, and this is something I, I want us to be very clear in our minds about. So, when somebody asks you about end times, you should be able to draw this chart and clearly explain. You know, these are the main sequence of events, right? So it should be very clear in our minds. So I'm just going to go through this again. And if you have any questions, you can ask. So we are now in the church age. And we are coming to the end of the church age, where the church's main commission right now is to take the gospel to all the nations. Make disciples of all nations. That's the main responsibility of the church. And uh, so that is happening and it's coming, you know, uh, I'm not saying it's over, but it's, we're not finished our work yet, but it's coming close. You know, so almost every nation has heard the gospel. Now it is more about has the gospel reached all the people groups, you know, small, small groups. That's where we are. Uh, what we'll and the other thing, uh, and we will talk about this later. Another thing that we should look forward to look at is Jesus is uh, Paul wrote, he said Jesus is coming back for a glorious church. You know, not for a church that is weak, powerless, that doesn't know the truth. You know, he's coming for a glorious church. So that's another thing we should be looking at. You know, that the, the Lord is bringing the church to a glorious church. And then is when we can expect the coming of the Lord. So the next event that we are expecting is the rapture of the church. Right? So the church will be taken out of the way. And then begins the seven years of tribulation. During the seven years of tribulation on earth, in heaven, uh, so when the rapture of the church happens, every believer who is alive at that time, and every believer who has died in Christ, and all the Old Testament saints, right? so those who have died, Old Testament saints, believers who have died, their spirit and soul is with the Lord Jesus. Right? And we are believers living on earth. earth. So in the rapture of the church, all of us instantly will receive glorified bodies. And we will meet the Lord in the air. And He will take us to heaven. So we are there. Every believer is there. At that time, tribulation begins on earth. So some more people will become believers on earth. So we call them like as tribulation believers, if you want, or tribulation saints. That means during tribulation, they believed after the rapture of the church. So they are also believers, but it happened after. 
So Rapture Church, every believer, every saint of God is in heaven with glorified bodies and they are going to receive rewards and all of that. Right? So our works will be tested. We will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We will receive rewards for what we have done. Uh, we will be entered, uh, taken into our mansions. All that will happen. And we are going to, of course, be involved in worshipping, worshipping the Lord and all of that. And at the end of the seven years, there is going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, during what will happen during the tribulation seven years? That is where we journey through book of Revelation from chapter 6 to chapter 19. It gives our outline. Chapter 6 to chapter 19, Revelation, we went through. And we said, just take it in the sequence that it is given. As it is given, you take it in that same sequence. One by one, it will happen as it is given in Revelation 6 to Revelation 19. Some of, uh, uh, some of the key things we saw was, yeah, there are three sets of seven judgments. Hmm? There are the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. Seals, trumpets, bowls, seven, seven, seven. It's happening. Then we also saw another thing would be, there are 144,000 Jews whom God raises up. He anoints. And they are going to be his servants during the tribulation, preaching the gospel. Right? So we saw that there will be people who are saved, but many of them will be martyred. They will be killed. And then we also saw, uh, of course, the start of the tribulation will be with the coming of the Antichrist. He will come as a man of peace. He will, have a, he will make a seven-year peace treaty for the Middle East. But in the middle of that tribulation, uh, seven years, he will break his peace treaty. And he will break it. Right? He will change it. We also said there has to be a temple in Jerusalem. right? Because the worship will be, will be started. They will worship God. And there will be a temple in Jerusalem. That's also important. The other thing we said was, we saw in Revelation is, there are two witnesses that will come from the middle of the tribulation till the end of the tribulation, for the last three and a half years. Okay? And again, uh, another important thing we said was, Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, is the middle of the tribulation. Okay? Revelation 11, 1. Just remember that. So we, uh, we see all of these things. Uh, so from Revelation 11, 1 onwards, the Antichrist and the false prophet will change in their agenda the main agenda will be to get people to worship the antichrist the beast right but when you're worshiping the antichrist you're actually worshiping the devil who has given power to the antichrist and to the false prophet right so that is the main agenda to get people to and we also just mentioned about a world economic system and a world religious system being set up by the Antichrist and the false prophet. Right? And all this will collapse uh, by the end of the seven years of tribulation. The seven years of tribulation will end with the Battle of Armageddon. Battle of Armageddon. Okay? So those are the high points. It ends with the Lord Jesus coming, and he will destroy all the nations that have come against Israel. He will set up his throne in Jerusalem. Okay. And then, at that time, there will be another resurrection. That resurrection is for all the believers who have died during the tribulation. Right. Because there have been people who believed during the tribulation, believed in Jesus, and they would have been martyred or killed during the tribulation. So, at the end of the Battle of Armageddon, when at that time, the tribulation believers will be raised. They will also have glorified bodies. So in the millennium, all the saints, along with the tribulation believers, will rule and reign with Jesus on the earth for 1,000 years. Okay? 
they will also be the uh, unsaved, the, the general general people, the people who are not saved. They will be there. They will be on the earth. So that's why we rule and reign over them. We establish the kingdom of God. And Isaiah 65 describes life on earth uh, during the millennium. We, life will go on. People who build, plant, this, you know, all these things will go on. Uh, there will be people being born during the millennium. Okay, the nature of things will change, meaning uh, there will be peace because Satan is bound for one thousand years. Satan and his demons are taken out of the earth, so there will be peace. Uh, in that sense, there will be peace on the earth for one thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, Satan will be loosed. He will try his last attempt to go against uh, Jerusalem, against God's people. But God himself will intervene, will stop him. And Satan will be cast forever into the lake of fire. Okay. And then there is a great white throne judgment. After the great white throne judgment, all the believers are separated, taken into heaven, and the, the earth and the heavens are going to be renovated by fire. Right? And there's going to be new heavens and a new earth. And then on this new earth, God is going to bring the heavenly city, Jerusalem. Heaven is basically going to be set up here. God will bring that city here, a city that he has built. He will put it on this new earth. And the new earth and new heavens will be very different because we won't need the sun and you know we, the kind of things that we need now. God Himself will be the lights. Uh, life will be completely different. There won't be any of the evil and, and all these things that we see. That's the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, so that sequence is clear in your minds. If you have to explain to somebody, you'll explain. Okay. If you can explain to somebody, that means you're clear. That means you have understood it. Okay. Any question? See, like after seven years after the battle, people who are died in the tribulation will be raised, right? Yes. So here the resurrection, it means like they will get the glorified bodies. Yes. And the souls, their souls will be in heaven, even if they die during the tribulation. Or is it like they, their souls will be kept in... Uh... No, so remember, in the book of Revelation, we see time, uh, at least a few times, that the souls of the people who died during tribulation or martyr, they come up in heaven. No? So while these people have been martyred, their bodies are dead, but spirit and soul come to heaven. Right? And they will receive... There's the glorified bodies. At the end, there will be a resurrection. Yes. This Old Testament sayings. So when they were when they died, uh, their souls will go to paradise. Yes. So then, yeah. Uh, depends upon their their character, like they whether they believed in Yahweh God. Uh, Yahweh God. And then, and then when Jesus went to paradise after he he died on the cross, to whom he preached to the saints. So, so uh, till the time of Christ's crucifixion, the Old Testament saints who died, they went into paradise or Abraham's bosom, and they were held there. That means. Yeah, they kept because they can't go to heaven yet. Cross is not done. So they were kept in Abraham's bosom or paradise. So when Jesus died, he went to paradise. He went to Abraham's bosom. So he would have spoken to all these people uh, who are the saints who are in Abraham's bosom. But the Bible also says he announced to the spirits who are held in darkness. So on the other side, in hell, the some of the angels who have fallen are kept there in hell. So Jesus went and announced to them. So it's a when we when Peter says, you know, that uh, he preached the gospel, doesn't mean 
okay, we usually preach the gospel so that people can get saved. So it doesn't mean that uh, God was trying to say, the Lord was trying to save these uh, uh, spirits that were held in prison, but is announcing to them uh, what has happened. So this is, uh, I think it's First Peter. Now let me just find the... Yeah, First Peter three, verses eighteen to twenty. For Christ also, First Peter three eighteen to twenty. For Christ also suffered once for us, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. For whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, a lark was being prepared in which a, f which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. So he's talking about going and proclaiming to these spirits in prison. Now, who is he referring to? Those who were disobedient. So it's on the other side. Yeah, those are, these were the angels. The fallen angels who tried to, you know, come into the uh, daughters of men, and then God took them and put them here. Kept them. So you cannot do this anymore. Hell, hell, put them there. So he's announcing to them. You know, it's over. Uh, in that he is the redeemer. I, I mean, I don't know what exactly he would have said, but he has preached to them, announced to the these spirit centers, and it's on the other side. And then, when he ascended, he took all the spirits of the Old Testament saints who were in Abraham's bosom, who were in paradise, with him into heaven. No, they are there. They are remaining there. They won't go to heaven, no. Yeah. He announced to them. So, like when I said, so when we say he preached to them, we can't, it's not like preach means, oh, to get saved or to repent, but to make an announcement, proclaim, to announce. The, 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 people, the people who, who didn't uh, accept Yahweh and the like the fallen angels, which we called the all aliens, hell, yeah. are all in the hell. In hell, yeah. Yeah, right now. Yeah. I think even Jude writes about this. Um, uh, so, so Jude mentions this he, in, in Jude chapter 1 verse 6 he says the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day right? Jude 1 verse 6 He's referring to these same angels, yeah, the fallen angels. Okay. Any questions from let me see if there are any questions from online students before we go to the next chapter. Any questions from those online? Everything is clear. All right, so having a clear overview. Right, of these sequence of events in your mind. Uh, if you can draw this chart and explain, that's good. That means you have understood the main purpose of this course, which is to get a good understanding of the outline of events. This is how it's going to happen. Okay, And you should be able to substantiate. That means say why you're saying it's going to happen like this. Right? Why you're saying? Why do you say rapture is going to happen before the tribulation? You should give the reasons. We have given it, we've listed it out in that chapter. You say, okay, these are the reasons why we believe the rapture of the church will happen before the tribulation. Then why are you saying the events will happen in this sequence? Well, because we're just following the sequence of the book of Revelation. That's it, very simple. That's why we are saying it will happen in this way. Uh, so that must be very clear. You should be able to explain. 
right? So now let's go to uh, the next chapter that we, uh, it's actually our last chapter, um, which is the signs of the times. That is, how can we, you know, how do we know how close we are? This is chapter 5 on page 78. Uh, how do we know? How close are we towards the rapture of the church at the beginning of the tribulation? How close are we? Right? What are the, some of the signs we can look at? Right? And I'm, I've, I've mentioned only some of the more important signs here. You know, some people will write, you know, you might find some books, 100 signs why Jesus is coming back. You know? So they'll put every little thing and make it so many points. Uh, this, so I, I, I didn't do, do it that way. I just put, okay, here are the main things you should look at, which the Lord Jesus gave us as signs of the end times, right? And this is a question. Even the disciples of Jesus asked him, you know, in Matthew 24, verse 3, they said, Lord, tell us when these things will be. What will be the sign of your coming? Right? So they're also interested. We want to know uh, if you're coming and you're going to be king, what will be the sign? So uh, we are going to look at some of the important signs. The first important sign which we should make note of, which is already which has already happened, but it is a very important mark is about Israel being formed as a nation. So, uh, and this happened in 1948, May 14, 1948, when Israel declared itself as a nation. So if you look at the history of that region, you know, which today we, we, we see, we, which, which of course the Lord promised to Abraham, way back in Genesis, um, and uh, we see that the Jews have, had been, have been scattered, dispersed from their land. And so, um, from about 1600s, uh, when the Turks, the Arabs and the Turks, began to dominate that whole region, the Jews had been dispersed. They are living in different parts of the world. And that whole region was dominated by the Turks or the Arabs, um, uh, the Ottoman Turks. And so Israel as a nation didn't exist. They had a history. That means they could always go back and read in their scriptures that God had promised that land to Abraham. But from the middle of the 16th century, uh, sorry, that would be the from the 1650s, so uh, the 17th century, uh, it, it wasn't there. The people were all scattered. But something was happening in the sense the Jews started slowly moving back to their own territory. They're on their own. They didn't have a nation. It was not there. Israel was not there. The Turks were there. Um, but they started relocating on their just on their own. They started moving back to towards Israel. You know? Slowly they're gathering, going, getting back to their own country. And then we uh, uh, the First World War, Second World War, the the British were involved. And uh, in some way, they they overthrew the uh, they overthrew the Turks, and in some way, they were instrumental in helping the Jews who had regathered, who had slowly you know moved back into this region, giving them confidence. And I would use the word unexpectedly. Nobody was actually anticipating or expecting this. Unexpectedly, the people, the, the Jews, at that time they were known as the Zionists, 
declared themselves as an independent country, an independent state. Okay, so obviously it, something was stirring in their hearts for people to move back to that region, and things were being orchestrated in the way you know. I'm not saying these wars happened. <laughs> You know, I'm not trying to give that as a reason, but I'm just saying things happened. World War One, World War Two, where the Jews were so persecuted, they flee, they fled. Many of them, or at least they tried to flee, and many of them fled back to their own land, the, this region where they felt they would be safe. And then when they had all gathered. You know, enough number. They just suddenly declared declared them said, "This is our country. This is our land." Israel was born. So almost it's like fulfilling many of the prophecies that were spoken in the Old Testament, right? More than two thousand years ago. Right. So Jeremiah says, uh, Jeremiah thirty one verse ten. Uh, Jeremiah prophesied, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the islands far off, and say, He who scattered Israel will, gal will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. So Jeremiah prophesied. As, as, as Ezekiel, we know Ezekiel's very, very powerful prophecy by using the picture of a valley of dry bones. How suddenly all the bones come together, and then suddenly the flesh is coming on the, these bones, and then breath is coming, and then this army is standing up, and God is saying, "Hey, I will do that to you." Right? He says, um, "Verse twenty-one, Ezekiel thirty-seven, twenty-one: I will take the children of Israel from among the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel." Very powerful. Huh? God said, I'll do it. And this is Ezekiel. He's prophesying almost 2,000 years before. Of course, God gave the promise to Abraham. And in, you know, in between, people were scattered. He brought them back from Babylonian captivity. They're there in the land. Then Jeremiah, Ezekiel, both of them are saying, hey, even if you are scattered, God is saying, I will bring you back. And I'll make you a nation in this land. In 1948, it is happened. And it happens in a way that nobody can stop it. It's a nation now. You can't undo it. People are already there. They have declared themselves a nation. Now, all around are the Arab nations. North, south, everywhere, fully surrounded. But even they can't stop it. They will not be able to stop. Everywhere, Arab nations. It's just like, um, you know, so they wars have been fought and still now are being fought. But Israel is standing as a nation. Nobody can shake it. Right? So for us, we say, Israel coming back as a nation is very important because Many of the end time prophecies has to do with Israel and with Jerusalem. So even when the angel Gabriel in Daniel chapter 9, when he spoke to Daniel, verses 24 to 27, he said, Daniel, I'm going to talk to you about your people and about your nation, about your city and about your people. I'm going to talk to you about the 70 years. So that 490 years we, we mentioned. He said, I'm speaking to you about your city and your people. Yeah. So, uh, and, and what, what, what we see happening in the book of uh, Revelation, a lot of it has to do with Israel, with the Jews who, are, who become believers and so on. So unless the people of Israel were there, you know those the what what is going to unfold in the book of Revelation uh, could not 
take place. So Israel coming back as a nation is a very important sign that we are, it's almost like, okay, this is 11.59, one more minute left to 12 o'clock no. before the coming of the law. It's like we are here, now all the remaining things need to be fulfilled, Jesus will come. Okay, so now in Matthew 24, verse 32 to 34, and I, and, I, and I know I mentioned this in the very beginning, Jesus said, you know, when you, you look at the fig tree, when you know the fig, the fig tree is putting out its leaves and uh, is getting ready to bear fruit, you know summer is coming. Right? Now, of course, he's saying, you know, he's trying to say you understand the little meaning is, hey, you know how to understand the seasons by looking at what is happening in nature. That is the little meaning. But some people also say that, hey, fig tree is symbolic of Israel. Right? So that's another meaning. Or oh, if the fig tree represents Israel, then he's saying, hey, and the fig tree starts to blossom, it's coming as a nation, then you know, the time is near. So that is one way of understanding it. So uh, for us, we say, oh, uh, Israel has come together as a nation. It's beginning to blossom as a nation. And we know in Scripture the fig tree is used uh, to talk about Israel. Um, uh, so that is important. And Jesus said, one generation will see everything. Right? One generation will see everything. Now, um, what is one generation, whether it's 40 years or 120 years? You know, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, because uh, if you look at the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew, uh, or generally it's like, okay, 40 years, maybe one generation. Or if you look at the lifespan from Genesis 6, 120 years could be one, the lifespan of one generation. So exactly what is the number of years? You know, so it's, oh, how many years? Is it 40, 60, 80, 120? <laughs> I don't know how exactly you'd say it. But generally, you could say between 40 to 120. Like the lower limit is 40, upper limit is about 120 years. So something in that range, you say is one generation. But he said one generation will see everything happen. So now we are not going to try to do the math from 1948 at 120. So that is 2068. By 2068, everything will finish. <laughs> so we're not trying to force you know, and do this thing. But we're just saying, Jesus said, one generation will see everything. Right? So within a, a short span, from the time Israel became a nation, becoming a nation, we can expect things to happen and happen very quickly, all the remaining prophecies. Right. Um, the second sign that we keep looking at, number two, right, is that is Jerusalem becomes the center of conflict. Right. So Israel, after they formed themselves as a nation, 1948. Remember, at that time, Jerusalem was still under Arab control. Because they they still have their mosque and everything over there. Then 1967, there was another battle when uh, I think six other nations tried to attack Israel suddenly. Egypt and Syria and all joined together, tried to attack Israel. They said, oh, we'll attack them suddenly. So they attacked suddenly, but this little nation of Israel pushed them all back. And they took more land. So they captured Jerusalem, they took the Golan Heights in the north, they took more portion in the south. So when these other nations joined together and attacked Israel, and so Israel losing ground, Israel gained ground. So then they said, hey, we can't mess around with this nation, they're very powerful. They're small people, small nation, but very strong. So Israel gained ground, and that's when Israel captured Jerusalem. 
But then, in order to maintain peace, they reached a settlement. They said, see, we know, uh, because now if Israel captured Jerusalem and they said, okay, we are going to take over the full mosque and everything, uh, surely it will escalate. All other Arab nations will join and come to fight. So the commander-in-chief of Israel army at that time, he said, okay, we will make a peace thing. East Jerusalem, where you have your mosque and everything, you keep it under your control. West Jerusalem, we will be our control. So they agreed. So they paused the war, stopped the war, agreed to that. So the Arabs are controlling that part. They come and pray and go on their side. This side, the Jews come pray and go, keep it this side. But it has become a point of so much tension. Because Jews still feel that is our place. Before the mosque came, before uh, this dome came, it was our place. So it has become a point of conflict. So Jerusalem because has become a point of conflict. And, and uh, since that time, uh, you can see, you know, battles have Small things happen, big things happen, or constantly things happening. So, Zechariah 12, verse 1 to 3. This is what God says. And this is Zechariah prophesied. Page 80. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel, that says the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundations of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem. So now he's talking about this Jerusalem, city of Jerusalem. A cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding people when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. It shall happen on that day, I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all people. All who would heave it away shall will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. So Jerusalem becomes a point of conflict, and nations are gathered, you know, are, are involved trying to solve this problem. So literally today. Nations are trying to solve this problem in Jerusalem. How do you make it peaceful? You know? So, this second sign is very important. Again, this would not have happened if Israel was not formed as a nation. Suppose you think, the Jews are all scattered all over the world. And you imagine Arabs are living in Israel in, in the land that, that we know as Israel now. And uh, then there won't be any conflict. They're already they're already occupying all this thing there, and Jews are scattered everywhere. But the fact that 1948 Israel became a nation, 1967 they recaptured Jerusalem. From that time, this prophecy is being fulfilled. That Jerusalem has become a place of conflict and nations are trying to sort it out. Okay. So we keep, so when you're reading the news, okay, you keep an eye. What is happening to Israel, the neighbors? What is, what is going on with Jerusalem? Keep an eye. Because from a from a from a Bible prophecy interest, you know, that hey, we have to watch and see what's happening, uh, how these things how these things are unfolding, because we are already there. Some of the prophecies already fulfilled. Israel has become a nation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem has become a point of conflict. Next, what? The next thing we are anticipating now is. There has to be a temple. How is that going to happen? Will it happen before the rapture? Will it happen after the rapture? We can't, we don't know exactly because the Bible is not telling clearly. We have some ideas, we can make some guesses, but the temple has to come. If the temple comes before and we see it, oh wow, it's amazing. Bible prophecy is fulfilled. But my feel is that 
it will happen after the rapture because the Antichrist will come and he will broker peace. And I think part of the peace deal would be, okay, Jews, you have your temple. Arabs, you have your land. Be Both of you be happy. Right? So I think, right? I'm guessing, but I think that would be a, like a peace deal that he would be able to broker and make them happy, both sides happy. But it will last very short, three and a half years, that's all. Okay, so let's pause here. We will continue this in the next after the break. Okay.